recording has started. I just need to give you this the slides. Getting the <laughs> okay. That part. All right. Okay. Yeah. Then this final paper is um, it's a bit different than the other ones and. Um, the first ones. It looks more into learning styles, which is, uh, I don't know if we necessarily call it a, call them theories, but at least they are more into trying to classify and describe how students typically prefer to learn. Uh, and this one is, uh, I picked it because it uh, is a good view of some of the most used models for learning styles. Uh, but also trying to run a similar type of, uh, or trying to uh, look at some of the students they have and trying to uh, look at their learning styles and trying to discuss that, which is a part that I don't think is so good. But okay, let's go to the first. Um, there are some different models on learning styles. There are uh, many more than these ones, or several more than these ones. But these are the, uh, the um, most common ones. The ones referred to. Uh, I'll uh, go into a little bit, explain them, and then we'll discuss some of the issues related to applying learning styles in systems, and then finally again reflecting a little bit on the paper. So the paper um, is, as I said, um, both literature review of learning styles, and there is a survey of 106 students, and their preferred bark style. Mark is one of the, uh, the models. Come back to that. Um, the first model is Combs model, and is um, there are two uh, there are two uh, axes here. One is what is your uh, or a, a student's origin of learning? Is it from a concrete experience, or is it from an abstract conceptualization? So how do you get into learning? Do you prefer starting with reflect or starting with a given experience, or starting with more an abstract notion? And then you have two uh, or an axis that goes from that idea from the learning. How do you uh, deepen, if you want? How do you transform the uh, the, the origin into the learning? Do you like to actively experiment, try over and over and over again to figure out how it works, or are you sitting down and reflecting on it? And now, is, as in many, uh, if you've been into management literature, you typically find these type of divisions. You get four different types, <laughs> each and every square. So the converger is one that is uh, learning by reflecting, but it's testing his, uh, his ideas in, in Case. Uh, the diverger is on the uh, other side. The, the origin is he sees something that he wants to to uh, understand and learn, and then he sits down and reflects on that. Then you have the accommodator, which is uh, someone who is um, based on the concrete experience, but is trying to deepen that by actively experimenting. And then finally, you have the one who is uh, with the, uh, the assimilator, who is the idea, uh, the, the learning starts from this abstract idea and is reflecting on top of it. So it's not so much experimenting at all. These are kind of different uh, styles. And uh, in the paper, there, there is a, go to the next slide, to find a, a table that shows what are the characteristics of these four types of, uh, of uh, learners. So here, for instance, the converger, they will be able to make practical application or ideas by deductive reasoning, because that's what they do. They, they, um, uh, 
they uh, develop their or they transform by the deductive reasoning. Uh, but it's uh, they are their start, the origin is in the experience space. While on the um, yeah, simulator is more on the inductive, is reflecting on top of of, uh, of the, um, the abstract notion. Um, this is uh, I, I I would think I, I uh, this is not the most referred to model, uh, but I would think that. For a gamer, it might be more applicable this type of model than the VART model that deals with visual or the rewrite uh, kinetic that we'll come back to. Because I would, if you go back to the previous slide, I, I would think that the accommodator, the one that is actively experimenting on act on experiences, I would think that you find many gamers here, mm. but many more. Uh, theoretical people will be up uh, as, as simulators. They will reflect on the theories they already know and, and reflect on that. So I would just guess that would be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, but interesting to see. I, I think this might be a more interesting model to, to look for in in uh, gaming than the part model that is the the more common model. Mm -hmm. um, the um, Hanley Mumford model is trying to go. It's very similar to Cobb's model, but it's trying to go through what are the steps that a, a learner is going through in learning. So it starts by having an experience, one way or the other. Uh, that might be an experience that you, you, you reflect upon, or it might be or a conceptual idea, or it might be a real experience. So after having it, you start to review it. Think about uh, how could it be like that, and, and you start to um, uh, make it into a, uh, what you say, if you are to learn, you, you need to not just do it, but also um, understand a little bit of what, why you want to do it. And then the next step would be to conclude. So we have been reviewing, and you conclude. So you have gained some new knowledge, you've learned something, because you had an experience, you reviewed it, and tried to understand it, and now you, you conclude and you understand it. Which brings you to the level that you can go to the next step because you never, you never stop to learn. You will always be at the next level. So now, and here, if you use it with the goals, uh, goals idea, you can go back and uh, either experience something for real or in your from some of the conceptual idea, you're thinking, oh, that might not be the whole story, and then you start again to to develop this. Based on this, they have. The, the activist, which is the one that typically is uh, focusing on that experiencing new things that can trigger new learning. And you have the reflectors. Those are the ones that whenever something new happens, they will sit down and start to reflect on top of it. The theorists will be more trying to go through all the discussion and trying to, to uh, simulate and, and conclude. And then you have the pragmatists will be there, OK, but we need to go, go on. <laughs> Continue. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit, a uh, little bit more process oriented towards how is knowledge uh, gained or, or or created, and uh, a little bit about the the characteristics of the uh, different types, and then activities that they would typically choose or, or prefer. Um, you read the paper, and I, I think it's. Uh, it's not so important or interesting to go into the various details. What is more interesting is what can we use that for. So that is um, uh, the, the, the final model is the BART model, which is the most um, referred to because I think it's it's quite easy and there are questionnaires is available that everyone can run. So BART is done for the visual, the oral, read, write, and kinesthetic. The question is, how do you prefer to get to learn material? Um, and um, the, the uh, um, did you do? Did you all do? So what did you end up? Uh, what what styles did you end up? Um, model. Uh, which one. all four or? Uh, well, I got ten at read write, eight at oral, uh, five visual, seven. 
Okay. So, so a mix. I don't yeah, know how to. Not that. not nothing very very. Mm. Well, I think it. Well, probably right. Yeah. Any of the other guys? Did you guys do this? No. I don't remember my own. It's really significantly on that. Right. Even like more like I don't know. No, no. That's do that. Yeah. So I did multi model as well with a strong bias towards visual and kinesthetic. I had 15 in visual and 15 in kinesthetic, okay. and only a few points for oral and read -write. Oh, OK. Yeah, very biased towards those right. two. Yeah, I'm, uh, to me, oral is almost disappearing, but the other ones are almost equal. OK. <laughs> it's multiple, but not much oral. Yeah. Um, OK, that's interesting. Um, and that is, uh, um, uh, as I would say, it's, it's kind of an impro important um, distinction in terms of the way we lecture, for instance. Uh, if I, uh, since I'm low on oral, if I was sitting in and someone just talks for two hours, no slides, no graphics, nothing, it would I would probably find that quite hard. Uh, mm. While uh, those who are more oral are a little bit, uh, I would assume, uh, find it more. Uh, confusing that I'm having all these images and I'm right on the board and I'm much more kinesthetic. So, mm. uh, okay, maybe the next slide. Because the, um, uh, yeah, just go on. The, uh, what's more, um, yeah, the question now is how do you uh, measure this? So, there are some instruments for, for measuring. And you, some of you already did on the bar, and there is similar for two other models. Questioners, uh, and there are other instruments for, for testing the, uh, the learning style. But I think what is um, uh, interesting now is what would the learning style, what does it mean for games for education, for technology for education in general? And I think that uh, implications, if you look at the, the student perspective, uh, I think that the one thing that we would like to accomplish with games is to the self-efficacy, which means that giving the student control, self-driven learning, uh, full control learning, and by knowing your style, uh, it will be easier for you to understand why, might be easier for you to understand why some uh, forms are better, some are not so good, or might be showing you that you might need, want to improve on one of these styles because you are weak and uh, lots of material that is being taught, presented to you, happened in that form. Uh, so knowing more about your own personality and your style will make you better at designing your own uh, study activities and this strategy, very strategy. Um, and it may help to increase your motivation and learning outcomes just by being aware of why something is hard for you or why something is something that you find easier and we may be able to adapt. Um, I had one student, I don't know if that's a good uh, good strategy, but I had one student who was negative on oral. He had he couldn't remember anything being said. So he would, uh, would uh, only look at what happened on the uh, uh, board and he was also very much kinesthetic. So, to learn, he was basically trying to write, rewrite all the textbooks. Mm. He had to write them down because by writing what was in the textbook, you can remember. By reading, he wasn't able to. Mm. So, so it would give you a kind of a, a strategy for uh, being better uh, at learning. But from the teacher perspective, there is something with trying not to create environments that become barriers. Mm. So, as I'm saying, if you are just talking, or if you are um, just the just designing activities that are very experienced, hands-on, then you're going to lose some students that are more reflective, or lose students that are are more visual. So, being aware and and trying to make it so that there uh, you can uh, make it easier for all types of students 
to enjoy the uh, activity, learning activities. Now, there are some issues related to the whole learning style uh, field. And one is um, the scientific foundation. Um, there is still quite a lot of debate, and some call this theories, and some say, no, it's not a theory yet. It's, it, it hasn't been empirically proved. So there is, there is something here still in terms of the empirical evidence to, to clearly uh, um, have a theory or an, an empirical basis for classifying uh, scientifically strictly. It doesn't mean that it's, uh, it can't be useful, but it means that uh, it might be hard to define exactly these classes. And, uh, and, so on. and there is also a question. Uh, is the preferred style stable over time and also in contexts? Are you preferring the same style whatever you are trying to learn, or is it depending on the context? Uh, and, uh, and how stable it is over time? And, and is it so that you can't change the preferred one? Is it something that you can, with efforts, change? So there are some questions here in terms of um, how much we should adapt a piece of software or, or a game to a specific style. I think that, uh, that is uh, something that we may not uh, find useful. And finally, uh, how can we make use of that? For instance, uh, should we try to make it so that all content is, pre is presented in all styles or take all styles into account? Or should we rather encourage students to be better learning in all styles, better at all, all phases of learning, at all forms of, uh, of content? Uh, and should, we, should students, how much should they be challenged? And how much should we make it easy? Because uh, learning is about going through a transition. And as Simon was showing last time, if it's too easy, then it's boring. It's too hard, it won't do it. So there's something in between there. And how the, the learning style fits in there is also something that we, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit on, uh, on the paper. Um, I, I think it's, as I was saying, it gives us a good summary of these learning style models. So it means that in, uh, by reading less than 10 papers, you have an kind of an idea what it is and some pointers to go more in depth if you want to do really look into the learning styles in terms of see whether there's certain learning styles that you can find that some uh, games are more effective for students uh, with certain learning styles. Um, and it discusses some of the limitations. But I, uh, yeah, uh, I think there are some, uh, there are a couple of things I don't like. Uh, one is what I, what I call incomplete presentations or results which means that they look at the training case. But they don't specify what's, what, is, what is the training, that what distinguishes the training that they are trying to apply this uh, method or these this models on compared to or the work model on, compared to the other, other styles. And, and they are referring to one paper here, one paper there, but they don't have an elaborated, detailed, uh, good study of their case that they're looking into and the, uh, the models and the literature they have. So, so I feel it's, it's kind of missing in terms of uh, the, um, the discussion of, of the results. And also, um, the, uh, the results and discussions are mixed into one big soup. So it's hard. Uh, the other paper I was showing, I can go back to the raw data and pick out the raw data. But here, um, it's, it's hard because it's some, of the, uh, some of the results they present uh, they say they they starting talking about the uh, the multimodal work uh, and some combinations, but they don't show the the actual data. They have a little bit of a discussion and the presentation results in one soup. So it's hard for me to go and do the same analysis that I did in the previous paper. And uh, some of the conclusions are not so interesting, which is means that the research questions are better. So if you click one more. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the research confirmed the finding of other literature on learning styles in establishing necessary to understand various learning styles. Okay, 
I'm, but nothing, um, nothing really uh, asks for such a, such a confirmation. I mean, it would be interesting if they can say, OK, because we looked at a different group of users or a different mm -hmm. context, but they just repeat what has already been done several times, and that doesn't add much. Mm -hmm. And they have what they call conclusion without evidence. They say, it also confirmed that the delivery or training or teaching material should be done according to the student's preference than the instructor preference to yield better results. They have no data mm -hmm. whatsoever Support. in their own study that confirms that. And they don't clearly discuss the, the other papers that makes it easy or makes it appropriate for them to make such a, such a conclusion. So the paper has some, some issues, I think, in terms of the way they deal with their own study, the, uh, the presentation of the results, and the conclusion. But on the part that describes the, uh, the models, it, it's quite good. Mm -hmm. Anyone reading it differently? Or? I skipped most of the part where they, uh, where they looked at the training specific case, because I didn't think they had a, a good definition of what was the training case, and they didn't have a good uh, discussion of the literature that was related and relevant. So. It was mostly interesting to see the various models and exactly. what they were, just to learn about them. Yeah. That's also the main reason I think the paper. So, uh, mm -hmm. other than that, it's not a very good paper. So, if you are to if you are to apply a learning style model, you should do better than this when it comes mm -hmm. to that, the second part of the paper. Um, it's it's certainly not uncommon for people to include in a um, discussion um, a claim that isn't backed up by the evidence in your paper. Um, this is something you do have to be careful of because it does kind of show you their their personal interest in why they're doing the paper, but they'll sometimes kind of suggest that this is true without even any, any evidence for it. Um, you often see this in the difference between correlation and intervention. Um, so they say, oh, there was this correlation between these two things, therefore you should do this. Right? Even though they've got no evidence that doing that thing will help, they just show they just have evidence that, you know, um, reading to your children means that they're more likely to go to university. Um, so you should read more to your children. And they've actually done that intervention study and found that there's no benefit of forcing parents to read to their children. The thing is, if parents care enough about their children to want to read to them, those children are more likely to go to university. <laughs> but the intervention, forcing someone to do something, doesn't change the outcome. So, so you're just, just having some evidence that there's a correlation means nothing about what you should do. You have to intervene and actually test the change before you make those sort of things. No. Yeah, I, I found it quite interesting the the presentation and the um, the different models applied differently to the serious games, um, and that the question is whether the multimodal uh, preference is beneficial for learning, or whether targeting a particular preference is better. Like well, as you pointed out, they didn't uh, had any evidence suggesting that, and there is some evidence suggesting that multimodal learning is usually you you retain more in, in your memory if you kind of exposed to the same material through different media through different means. Uh, so that was a little bit yeah surprising. <laughs> but I didn't have evidence. So no, <laughs> it was just a statement. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can. Right. So we what we can do is we can. Um, view your questions uh, for the um, I just have to take this video so the idea was for you guys to post uh, questions related to all three articles and then we can discuss uh, we can discuss them here, or for you to discuss some answers, like for two of the questions um, yourself. But 
there, there was no deadline for that. Therefore, we don't actually have, you didn't prepare the answers, so we can't discuss those, those answers today in the class. So we did change a little bit the, um, the schedule for posting the questions and then submitting the answers. So then we can discuss the questions and the answers in the class next week. So the, the schedule is, um, if I go to the schedule, the schedule is so that um, the articles are posted today, and then you have the week, the, the, to the end of the week, to read them and post questions. So the, the Friday, Friday midnight, we will expect all the questions to be already posted. And then we will review the questions, format them, and post them uh, by Monday. And then um, right, so I actually have to do the voting on the weekend. <laughs> so but um, it depends how many questions we have and how many papers we have. So this week, we only had five questions per paper anyway. Uh, if we have more, then the idea was that you vote on the questions before you pick the ones which you will answer for. Uh, so we limit the, the answers only to the best top questions. Um, so you post the questions on Friday. I, uh, we put the questions online. And then by Monday morning, you voted on the questions. On Monday, you have all the questions. You pick two. You prepare some answers for them. And then on Tuesday, we have the questions plus answers, and we can discuss them. And that's sort of um, the idea for the new schedule. Uh, so what do you think? Would, will it work better? Yeah. There was a question from Johannes whether you can answer your own question. And I thought you probably shouldn't pick your own question for the answer. Uh, because that would sort of uh, skew the, the way you pose the questions. You will not be objective in asking questions if you can well, sort of. The, the, the first, the purpose of the game is to be allowed in the learning outcome, which is that you should try to read and understand as much as possible in the papers. Yes. So, yeah. so if you're answering somebody else's questions, that will challenge your. Yeah, you're thinking more than answering your own questions. So someone's already looking <laughs> into the mechanics here. Which is good. Yeah. <laughs> right, so th this is already on Frontier, and um, I will kind of tidy up the formatting a little bit, but that's the, the, the new idea. Um, and we do the same thing as we did this week, so you will just email me. Uh, the questions, and I will email you back, and then I, you will email me the answers uh, by before the lecture. So we will use the email as a time stamping machine. We were thinking of using Frontier, but in Frontier it's sort of tricky to yeah to keep opening and closing the submissions, and it's too complicated. Yeah, e email is probably much simpler. Um, so what we can do now is just check. It just means that we can, at our own discretion, all of a sudden start adding new rules to the game. You see that something is not working way through. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm quite sure we will. So what we can do is we can spend some time like uh, going through the um, the questions and thinking of what the answers could be now. Um, so the the first question is how did the authors choose which papers to include and how they decided on the scope of the of the paper for the survey paper about the educational games. So I think that question was already answered by, uh, by Rune's presentation. And they clearly identified the methodology of how they scoped narrowly the, 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 the survey. Um, so as Rune said, the, the advantage of that is that you don't end up with thousands of papers. You end up with the manageable subset. In their case, 40 might have been a little bit too small for some meaningful statistical comparisons. Um, uh, does educational games for mathematics show positive learning results? And how does the frequency of play affect the learning result?
course I remember in mathematics. I think something that they found out was that um, people with English as their second language that they got some improved results. At least one of these studies mm -hmm. showed that uh, <laughs> See if I remember this, and I think it was something that because they were learning in a more um, um, maybe usually they wouldn't follow the uh, uh, the normal lecture if they wasn't uh, good, and they uh, could learn better from these games. Mm. Yeah, I think this uh, this basic paper was as uh, to say as uh, coherent because if you look at the data set. Mathematics that, that has about the same distribution as, uh, as the, uh, the average of the That's mostly positive. Mm -hmm. uh, we some uh, negative, both negative and some negative, but it's not significant. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do go into detail and depth about one study, and they, besides yes. what you were saying, there was also one about boys. Yeah, mm -hmm. Boys who yeah. played a lot, they didn't learn much, but boys who played a little learned more than those who didn't play yeah. as well. So, I mean, but they had no, no, they didn't go into the no. mainland. That's, that's more on what they study, or what they, some details. Uh, yeah. And that was a little bit surprising as well, the, 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 those uh, comparisons, because it, they seem kind of ad hoc, really, not yes. really uh, properly backed up. To the so I, data. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's probably because those that play only a little, only play a little because they found it to be very easy. <laughs> and they were already they good, already you know. <laughs> Might be, exactly. But it was kind of a weird comparison, but male. Uh, exactly. Language minority <laughs> students who play <laughs> daily, yeah. they had higher mathematical performance than male English speaking students. I wouldn't be too much trusted. That. No, no. <laughs> That's right. Not too much, maybe. Well, so I, I, the way I was, uh, when, I, when I read this, I, I was thinking that the one who talked to the question was, uh, was interested in that uh, specific mm -hmm. in the paper. But what I would, uh, the way I would answer is what I was saying, I look at the numbers, they present. Because that, that's their, mm. their empirical basis would be their study, and that would be in that big table. Mm -hmm. So I run the analysis on that big table, and there's no significant difference. Between no. This they really table. wanted to find some. Uh, Something, yeah. Yeah, or, or they refer to some paper that they yeah, didn't deserve much specs. So, what are some of the barriers that make it difficult to incorporate serious games in teaching. Or, or results they present without the empirical data. It's just a discussion, you yeah. know, they're trying to summarize papers they've been reading, but not referring specifically to any paper from what we Or extracting some data out of it. Yeah. Not, not a very elaborate analysis. They it's think just, that was. Again, it's more towards the statement side than the real findings that is evident. Yeah, so I, I think the answer for that question actually was better with the other paper, which went into details and analyzed some of the interactions and, and so on. And this, for example, this involvement of teachers in the process or the external versus developers being uh, evaluators, that also is sort of significant of how, how things are implemented uh, and deployed in the classroom. Yeah. Um, all right, so... Yeah, that one was a long question. So there so seem to what, be. What, yeah. what do you guys think of those five questions? Which does the class think is the best question? What is the most kind of insightful question, the one that asks you to think most about the content of the paper?
Just pick one, one to five. If you can't think of most insightful, what do you think would be the nicest one to appear on the exam? Uh, what did you say? What would be the best one to appear on an exam? Okay. <laughs> ah, but the problem with the easiest one is, is if you're looking to differentiate your ability. How can you differentiate? If you really get it right, then like, how do you know? How do you get an A is if it's too an easy, a too easy a question. Well, I think that uh, if we were to anchor it, anchor the question, which question was most uh, or, or uh, tightest bound to the actual study, uh, most relevant, the most related to the actual paper, I would say the first question is next. It was specific in the design. The other ones are more, a little bit, not the major results of the major design, major results of the paper is more on some uh, special features yeah. discussed here and there, I, I, I feel. But I think for the exam, maybe the third or fifth are more appropriate, because then you're not asking for a specific paper, but rather concepts for the course. But if we're going for specific papers, then maybe Rune is right and number one is the best. Yeah, so I agree. I think number one is more anchored and more closed form, whereas questions three and four are more open-ended, which the paper can be an, as input, but you can go beyond that. You can sort of uh, answer the questions beside the paper, right? Whereas the first one you can't answer without reading the paper. <laughs> yeah. So which kind of questions do you want us to submit? <laughs> like the first one or the other? <laughs> this is a game you have to design. <laughs> they're, they're both will tell. They both have value, yeah. They both will tell. So. Um, the, the hopefully in, in, in the process of the game, and we, um, Runa, I, and Marius will have voting um, powers as well, but um, <laughs> we will vote like the rest of you. So um, what you're trying to do is you're trying to appeal to the students and us to make interesting questions. <laughs> um, we still have to decide what interesting means internally ourselves, so um, we're still trying to work out what you think, what you guys think are good questions and you guys are also working out what we think see is good questions. So, um, it, and it's a bit fluid at the moment. We try, we can try and decide. Um, maybe uh, to say, well, you know, sometimes it's it's good to have a very specific question about this paper because it was very interesting that specific thing. And sometimes they're more general papers, and so the general questions are, are better. So, I know that's something for us to kind of work on through the semester. Hmm. Shall we go to the next questions? Yep. So maybe let's uh, let's do the next next uh, article. Um, so from information to experience, that was the sick uh, at the um, South Bay article, South Beach. Um, so what concerns does the author raise about game polish? Yes, yeah, so Rune already answered that as well. So the, some of the things were not fine-tuned, and then there is a question whether things should be fine-tuned if the teachers are sort of participatory elements, uh, agents in the in the game, and things are kind of purpose-built on the fly for the particular student group and so on. So certain things may always be a little bit unfinished. Um, I wasn't sure exactly how the augmented reality aspects worked. Because to me, it looked more like a card game, like with some cues, and then you, you're making some decisions. It seems that the, the player's position was updated on that, uh, yeah, on that screenshot, but it wasn't explained in the paper. Like, uh, you couldn't the guess. They gave feel, and then they come close to hot spots, so there was kind of... Yeah. It seemed like you only got access to information if you were close yeah. to the place where 
the yeah. information was really about. I think they actually went out, because they mentioned that they were out from the beach and some students were looking at their PDA and almost... Mm. Uh, right. Walking, walking through the... Yeah. that's right, yeah. So, they must have... Yeah. They yeah. Yeah. And the they didn't show up until they were... until they were yeah. in the information. Yeah. So and if you use the application when you're somewhere else, you might have the problem of the hotspot being in any place you can't actually physically reach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to be there. Or in yeah, somewhere they had in the GPS, uh, I guess the area, area is, but it was kind of lacking in details. In the That's right. Yeah. So one thing was the the polish of the game itself, and one was the the details of the paper about the game to to kind of tell all the details. And we already discussed the 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 paper didn't went into the game mechanics and other elements which would be useful to to know more about. Um, so how does the game-based learning environments differ from the traditional school learning environment in the use of documents and resources? That was the main, one of the main themes of the, of the article. And I think it's a very good question. It, it is a very That's good question. That's very good for the exam as well. Yeah. Yeah. So anyone wants to chip in? Problem solving rather than just listening to the information and things more. Yeah, it makes the students more active. Mm -hmm. And also, the students are required to actually seek out information in these hotspots and to interviews that they get access to and stuff like that. Whereas in a classical lecture environment, you're usually just given a handout and you read it and that's it. Mm -hmm. You don't actually have to go search for information unless it's a project, in which case you usually do that, but not in a classical like. Lecture, yeah. lecture environment. Yeah. And normally you're just handed the right answer. You have to look up the uh, textbook and you ask the teacher a question. But here they had to actually get data and they had to analyze it and come to their own conclusions. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah what, what I found interesting also was that the students at the end of the process, they sort of owned the knowledge. They said, we know it, like instead of we being taught something. They sort of felt as if they acquired it themselves. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I think it has also something to do with timing here. Because in, uh, in the regular classrooms, it's, it's very hard to find the most optimal time to, to give that this information to a student. But here, they were receiving this information at the time they were ready to deal with it and needed it. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't so different. Students to, uh, to reach the same state at different times. We don't have to provide one to everybody, and uh, some students are already ready to, uh, to, to deal with it, and some students they can deal with them, and by the time they can deal with it, it's forgotten. It's so. mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it kind of relates to that concept of scaffolding of knowledge. You you need to reach certain level for the new elements to fit in. Otherwise, if, even if I if, if you told a particular element, you will not assimilate it because you're not ready to, to understand it or to to internalize it. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good good question. Um, both exam like and for discussion. Um, Okay, so what reasoning difficulties did the students involved in SIG at South Beach face when drawing conclusions, and how can this knowledge be used to improve game-based learning environments? So one one of the um, observations um, the the authors made were that the students couldn't easily um, um, guess certain conclusions which, based on the evidence, they should have. Uh, and they needed a little bit of a hint from the teacher, or they were drawing conclusions which were not adequate, 
and they yeah, they, they needed a little bit of a help. Perhaps that can tell us something about the school system and how much it teaches uh, uh, individual and the does it seem that they have problems understanding graphs and how to read them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. So, yeah. I, this is in America, right? Yes. <laughs> so, and their school system is much more based around there is one correct answer and you're supposed <laughs> to know it. So It's not you're supposed to find out, you're just supposed to read until you know what the correct answer is. More than other uh, countries. So that might have something to do with it. And uh, I think that they said that they wanted to um, um, create a game in a way that, that might not be just one answer. Uh, there could maybe be several correct answers. And sometimes the teachers had to really check out one things to make you know if they actually make want sure. just one yeah. answer. That's right. And uh, but, yeah, maybe they could say something about the uh, of the students. And uh, well, the um, paper was a bit critical of the school system in general. So. Um, there's also the problem of one student being more charismatic or mm -hmm. loud uh, when they're working in a group. So, for example, since they all have different roles, mm -hmm. if one role is occupied by a very domineering student pupil, Mm. and he or she has an opinion about, I am right, <laughs> and kind of just tramples the other students and goes with a conclusion drawn from one subset of data. And so you kind of put the rest of the students in a position where their work isn't valued, and it's not taken, taken into the, uh, consideration. But hopefully, I mean, if this was a widely adopted strategy, yeah. if we've learned that this, they would make that mistake once or twice, and then after that, no one would listen to these guys anymore because they know that they would derail all projects. They don't yeah. mm -hmm. so, so the learning attacks would be there, not the first round, but yeah. the second mm -hmm. third round. But so that requires a new paper, let's go, so we're not going to find it. It was interesting to uh, see how they have trouble Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I found it qu quite interesting though that they have been assigned a single role and then the teams were composed of multiple roles and then you became sort of an expert in that role only therefore you couldn't overshadow the entire group because yeah. you were not knowledgeable enough in the other areas in a, in a sense, right? Um, so that, that was a relatively interesting balancing mechan mecha mechanic in, in that particular game. Uh, yeah. And it's also sort of a halfway solution to the problem where you have a group work and there's four people in the group and then three of them end up doing all the work. Yeah. <laughs> if three of them is actually incapable <laughs> of doing all the work <laughs> because they don't have physical access to the rest of the data, that forces the class person to actually yeah, that's true. All right, uh, the next one, what are the projective identities and how they are used in a series of games and game worlds? I quite like that one as well. It was a detailed question, but gen generic enough to be useful in other contexts. Yeah. So actually, when I was reading emails from you guys and the person asked that question, I, I actually thought, oh yeah, it was in the paper. I had to go back and reread that, that thing because I didn't pay enough attention when I was reading the paper first time. Yeah, and it, this is very interesting, yeah. <laughs> so? <laughs> that was how uh, they uh, sort of identified with uh, being a doctor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they did their worst note. Yeah. So, it's, a so it, it's that it's like a meta level of that. So you not only identify yourself as a doctor, but you identify your other colleague as an ecologist, e ecologist as well. So you treat them as their roles too. So that's the that's the key, um, which kind of reinforces the the game mechanic in a sense. Yeah. I think it 
maybe gave them a little bit more confidence. Exactly. Uh, when they had learned some uh, new fancy words. Exactly. They were able to express. Uh, I think it, it imagined that they were very kind of almost a bit smug about it. Very, very. Yeah, special. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that knowledge is important to the team. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so the paper makes it clear that the students found the experiment fun and engaging. Not much was said about the actual learning outcomes. How would these students have uh, fared if compared to control group with traditional classroom learning? Are these types of learning games a better suited for personal development and life skills rather than purely academic knowledge? Um, that kind of requires a new paper. It's a different study, as, as Rune was also saying. Uh, you would need to have a control group. You would have to have more controlled um, environment. The design experiment wouldn't really kind of. But this is an interesting uh, question because uh, I mean they were uh, the paper was was taking I think it was quite amazing that they, uh, there are some academic um, outcomes and these were working mm. and there are some other like. Uh, to collaborate and communication skills and, and some other things. Now the question is how much it costs them to get that academic up. I think if you have to do lots of time just to <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah, but yes. if they had to use loads of time just to learn the academics that they maybe use less time in the Regular setting. Mm. So, so I think it's an interesting question, but I think that the, the uh, major weakness of the paper, as I was saying, is that they don't say clearly what the second learning outcome was. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, this question asks about the actual learning outcome, and I think the actual learning outcome is it's mostly interesting in relation to the expected learning outcome. They yeah. know what they were expected to, and with the efforts that uh, the effectiveness is connected to the new part. Yeah, I, I think there was an uh, opportunity to do that because they put some some stress on the dependence of those subsystems and the ecology as such as a complicated, mm -hmm. complex system of interacting entities. And they mentioned that by being there and by interacting with the environment and observing different things, the students appreciated the ecology, the, the bigger picture of the of the whole thing. But they didn't have any formal setup to, to measure any of that. Yeah. And how it compared to the classroom, to the typical yeah, classroom. How much did students learn? Because they were learning different things. So uh, maybe that's unfair to the students if some learn something more than others. I don't know. Mm. All right. So yeah, same same question as before. What would be the you know the best question? What would be the most insightful or the the most interesting question? Uh, we will we will vote on that uh, offline, I guess. And I I I do also like the perspective identities, Christy, um, because it, it 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 digs into an interesting part of the paper um, and and gets you to think about that. Um, so yeah, I, I I think it's 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 interesting to think what what is the best of these kind of questions. What's the most insightful? And I think we can we can vote offline on those. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> I think there are some good questions there. Yeah, definitely. All right, so the third article about the learning uh, styles. Uh, what are learning strategies and how can they help students and faculty improve learning? That's pretty um, uh, broad and, and relevant. Um, and the paper, as Rune was suggesting, goes really well into details of describing the different models and um, how they work, how they can help students and faculty members, that is not fully covered. Uh, we can use it as a, um, when designing the, the games. So for the um, for people who like experimentations and hands-on thing, the game can be slightly different to those who like analytical and reflective problem solving, puzzle like things. So, you know, you may have different types of game mechanic to accommodate different uh, uh, learning strategies. 
uh, for different people. How should businesses adopt learning styles into their training programs and what benefits could this have? Um, yeah, it goes a little bit beyond the, the serious games domain, uh, I guess. Yeah, this is more learning styles in general. Yeah. What are the implications of learning styles for human resources? Same, same as question two, kind of go a little bit broad on the learning styles in general. Um, when a trainer is seen as an expert by the trainee, it may create a barrier to learning. How? Well, the, the paper says that um, when the trainer is, you see the trainer as an expert, you kind of just go to the trainer whenever you have a question instead of trying to seek out new answers on your own. Mm -hmm. And this may create a barrier where if the trainer isn't actually an all-knowing omnipotent teacher, then their knowledge is limited. And so the trainee is limited to the knowledge of the trainer. Um, which is something that you want to avoid, at least in the corporate environment. I think this is a little bit the same as, as, as what I was just talking about. It's a little bit the same, even self-driven learning. So it's, uh, it's all the same. I think I see, yeah. There's a talent there. It's like uh, if, uh, if the uh, teacher wants to be the guru, then you are living by the guru. You expect the guru to have the right answers all the time, mm. and you can never be independent. Yeah, so I think that, yeah, that's the key, like the agency, the taking kind of ownership of things. Like if you do have this relationship, you, it's harder to do that. And with the game, the students were doing that because they were the experts. They were becoming the experts themselves in a way. Um, yeah. Okay, and the final question, uh, comparison between the, the different models sort of relates to the... Um, I think it's, it's relevant here in the, in the case of... If you were to adopt the model in the study, then it's relevant to think about the differences. Which so ones yeah. are more As, uh, relevant? Yeah. For me, I think that the uh, Holmes model is more interesting to look at than the purely uh, type of content of media that you, you prefer to communicate. Mm -hmm. So but that has more to do with how knowledge is created by the time you have uh, the process. Yeah. All right. So that's that's this week, I guess. Uh, next week we have um, games for health, and we have three articles proposed. Um, we're thinking of, of having two presenters next week, right? So two two people presenting one paper each, or three. I guess three papers and one presenter each, and I think you'd be curious. you planning on presenting a paper or what's up? Well, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we can have three students, because with three papers, it's plus the discussion. It's uh, we can we can see how it goes. Um, yeah, we we had three papers today plus the discussion, and we went over time. Uh, we can try to see how it goes next week, because uh, the alternative is that we may have three papers, but only two are being picked. Every paper has to be read though and asked questions, and and the questions has to be asked in the game, but not necessarily presented in the in the lecture. Uh, that's another possibility. Are they all short? Yeah, yeah. Three yeah. And one exactly. Today, so I think three we should be okay. Yeah. 
So we who would like to talk next week? Um probably talk. I can say yeah, it's time to eat. Yeah. So yeah, we can have a Johannes assigned to that one. Um, you would like to do your last one? Excellent. So let me just do that now. If I will be able to do that. <laughs> Correct spelling? Yeah. Correct spelling? Wow, awesome. <laughs> You can do the first one? What was your name? Bluff. Yeah. <laughs> Vlad. Oh, man. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. So, perfect. Very good. So thank you very much. We'll see you next week.